and add the seven. <laughs> Keep your Bibles open to Revelation chapter 12. The message this morning is God's end time church. The question I want to start with this morning is, does God actually have a remnant end time church? that is biblical, scriptural, and that you can find somewhere on the earth today. Is it important that God has a remnant church? As we continue to move towards the end of this earth's history, am I on? No. That's because this is a brand new mic. I'm not sure how it works. <laughs> Hold the button until the light comes on. That light's on. Green is on, red is mute. No, it's mute. <laughs> okay, how's that? Yep. Okay, that's better. Now let's see if this is going to work. Point at this. How about that? Not at that. Revelation 12, 1 and 2, as we read, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. This woman, if you turn to Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2, Jeremiah 6 verse 2, don't get lazy because I have it up here. <laughs> Take your Bibles, open to Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 2, so I can hear the pages. It says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to what? To a lovely and delicate woman. Jeremiah. Revelation 19, 7 and 8 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And who has made herself ready? His wife. So when you look at Revelation 12, 1 and 2, the woman here is who? Now I've done many Bible studies on this, and I've had people tell me, No, that's Mary, the mother of Jesus. Then I've heard others say, no, it's the church. How do we know who it is? It's actually pretty easy. You need to realize that there are three major schools of interpretation when it comes to the Bible and prophecy. Do you know what they are? Preterism, futurism, historicism. Do you know what historically Seventh-day Adventists are? Historicists. You'll find that if you do enough study, you'll find why historicism as an interpretation of Scripture is still relevant today and one of the best methods for interpreting the Bible. Let us be glad and rejoice and give glory to Him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife. Who is His wife? The church. That's you and I, right? And what does she do? She makes herself ready. Question for you to think about for the rest of the day is how does that take place? And to her is granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is what? The righteous acts of the saints. The sun in this symbol represents Jesus. You can find that in Malachi 4.2. The moon that she's standing on. In Hebrews 10.1 is the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. Where does the moon get its light from? It reflects it, right? So the entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament, where did it get its light from? They were waiting for the Messiah to come, right? The light wasn't in the sacrifices of animals. The light was what those sacrifices pointed to. And that was Jesus Christ, the Messiah who would come. Is that important to know? Yes, it's actually very important. It's a foundational principle of what we build our belief system on. Okay? So, the moon, then you have the crown of 12 stars. That represents the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament and the 12 apostles in the New Testament. Revelation 12, 2. You're going to have to read it because the picture flies. 
Revelation 12, verse 2. Say amen when you're there. Amen. Then being with child, she cried out and labored in pain to give birth. Skip down to verse 5. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God in his throne. Who is this male child? It's very easy. Okay, so the male child is Jesus. Verse 6, then the woman fled into the wilderness, and this is where you find out whether this woman represents Jesus, or, sorry, Mary, or something else. Okay? It's not hard to decipher. What does it tell you? It says, she fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there how long? 1260 days. If you take the principle found in Ezekiel, a day for a year, how long is that? 1260 years. You're going to find this over and over again in the book of Revelation. You also find correlating scriptures in the book of Daniel. So, when Mary gave birth to Jesus, they had to flee. Where did they flee to? Egypt. But did they flee down there for 1260 years? So, is it Mary that we're talking about here? No. Okay. Now again, you need to realize the faith community that I grew up in. They taught that that was Mary. Okay. 1,260 days. In the Bible, how many days are there in a biblical month? This is really important as well. Because if you go to interpret this using how we interpret months today, you will have a lot of confusion. But how do you find out what a biblical month is? Do you remember Noah? And he was in that boat for a long time. Right? You'll find out there how long a biblical month is. So 30 days, just to make this sense. 30, you trust me? Yes. 30 days. You can find out yourself. Look it up. So 30 days. 1260 divided by 30 equals what? Now turn to Revelation 13, verses 4 through 7. Ricky, do you have that? Yeah. In a loud voice, can I get you to read it? <coughs> Sorry, much. Hold on for a minute. Donald, will one of these things work? Yeah. Make sure. Make what color is the light? I don't know. the number. Ricky can figure it out. Number three, light. Number three? to us today? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. See, as we go into this lesson, there's some questions that I want you to think about as we're going into this. And I asked you already, if there is such thing as a remnant church that God has raised up, and if there is, is it still relevant today? And if the question to that is yes, and we can find and determine what that church is, and you find out you're a part of that church, do you think its message is still relevant today? Do you think the message needs to be changed, updated, made more palatable for the masses? Or do you think that God has given this church a specific message to preach under any season and at any time? If God has raised this church up and given it its message, 
then we are called to be faithful to that message. Amen? Amen. And you, as part of that church, are going to have to make the decision whether you will continue to be faithful to that message or if you're going to allow that message to be changed. You got real quiet on that one. Think about it. As we continue to go on, the question is, is why are you an Adventist? What's the purpose for us? Did God need another denomination? He has plenty. Did he say, well, I one more would do less well? Or is there a purpose that he had in raising up this denomination? So 42 months, Revelation 13, 42 months divided by 12 is what? You're going to find that in Scripture as well. Um, turn, turn to Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Daniel 7, 25. Daniel 7.25 says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand. This is a correlating verse to what Ricky just read. Do you see that? And there was a time period in the verse he read in Revelation there's a time period here in the book of Daniel. What's that time period? For a time, times, and half a time. A time is one year. Times is two years. And a half a time would equal how many? So that's a total of three and a half years. So I do all that to let you know that all these texts are speaking of the same event. The same event. Um, what would be the word? The same entity in history that the devil will use to persecute God's people, to persecute God's church, to change times and laws, and to bring about false worship on the earth. And not only bring it about, but also make laws to force you to break God's law. So when that happens, Again, you are going to have to make the choice of who are you going to be faithful to. Will you follow God or will you follow the laws of man under the control and the power of Satan? While it's easy, we're all saying, yes, I'm going to follow God. But if you don't follow God now, in your life, in your mind, and in your heart, when it's easy, you will not do it when it's hard. I didn't even get one amen on that. Let me say that again. If you do not follow God now in your mind and in your heart and in your lifestyle when things are easy, you will not do it when things get really hard. Amen. Amen. So right now is the time of preparation. We read the text that the bride made herself ready. Who's the bride? When is it time for the church to make herself ready? How do we do that? By keeping your eyes focused on Jesus Christ, knowing what His Word says, and being obedient to that Word. Understanding who we are as God's remnant people, the message that He's given us, and being faithful and carrying that message out. Amen? Amen. Turn back to Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. So do you see how all these texts tie in together? Mm -hmm. Revelation 12, verse 4. It says, In his tail drew a third... Sorry. 14, I was about to say, that's not right. Mm -hmm. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into wilderness to her place where she is nursed for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Is there any discounting that what you find in Daniel and what you find in Revelation is speaking of the same thing. Okay? Stay in Revelation chapter 12. We're going to look at the next player 
in this chapter, and that's the dragon. Verse 3 says, And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven horns and ten horns and seven diadems, which are crowns on his head. His tail drew what? A third. A third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman to do what? To devour her child as soon as it was born. So, you know the child is Jesus. You know this took place that at his birth, Herod wanted to kill him. You know that Herod sent his soldiers to kill all the children two years and under. And so they fled down to Egypt. Who was the power that was influencing Herod? Do you believe there's a real devil? Do you know how many people who call themselves Christians don't believe that there is a devil? That there is Satan and he's just as real as you and me? The question is, if there's no such thing as a devil and the Bible just uses it symbolically to explain evil, what do you do with all these texts in prophecy about this demon, this fallen angel who controls kingdoms and nations and people? So I tell you all that to let you know that the devil is real. He is not your friend. He is your enemy, and his only purpose is to destroy you. And we look and we say, well, you know, God and the church, they just ask too much. They put too many restrictions on me, and it's just not fun. That is one of the greatest tools that the devil has to deceive you. God never asked you to give something up or take something from you so that you will be unhappy. He asked you to give these things up so that He can actually communicate to your mind Amen. and allow you to know that He is real. In the Old Testament, where did the people go to be in the presence of God? Say it loud. That's, that's right. Okay? They went to the temple, to the sanctuary. New Testament Christians, where do we go to be in the presence of God? Anywhere, because you now are the temple of God. Amen. But how can the Holy Spirit live in a temple that's defiled by the world? Do you understand that why God raised this church up? And in the direction that it was going in the beginning is the way God wanted it to go. But because of unbelief, they started to move backwards. But God in His grace and His mercy sent a message. A message of love, a message of grace, but also a message of truth for God's people to hear, to see, and be obedient to. Amen? Yeah. Was that message received? <laughs> Are we still here? <laughs> was the message received? The answer is no. It was rejected. But, but... God in His grace and God in His mercy has brought us back to this point in time today to ask you as a church, as the bride of Christ, who are making yourselves ready, are you ready today to receive this message? Are you ready to be obedient to what God has called? The dragon, it's easy to figure that one out, that's Satan, but it's also important that you understand that it is the kingdoms and the nations and the political entities and also the religious entities that he controls. Isn't it strange that Satan controls religious entities? Is that a true statement? Yes. The stars that were thrown down to this earth, who do they represent? Here, who has a cell phone that has a calculator on it? Diana, you have one? Yeah. Pull it out and go 10,000 times 10,000 and give me the answer to that. What's 10,000 times 10,000? 100 million. Did you do that in your head? Or you just know that answer? Is it 100 million? 
Okay, so Daniel said 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Okay, so let's just say 150 million. Right? What's a third of 150 million? That's why I should pull your phone out. <laughs> What did you say, Ricky? Because I think you're pretty close. It's around 50 million, right? A third of that. It's 50 times 3. 150. So, you're smart. So listen. So if a third of those angels were cast down here to this earth, how many are here that are demons? 50 million. Is that a lot? Yes. Okay. But you say there's 7 billion people on this planet. That's a lot of people, right? Is 50 million a lot of powerful demonic angels? No. Yeah, think about that, okay? Think about the influence that they have and they wield and how much pain and suffering goes on every day on this planet. Why is that? Do you realize that's the reason why Charles Darwin left Christianity and came up with the theory of evolution? Because he couldn't reconcile in his own mind if God was such a benevolent, loving God, why there's so much pain and suffering. And in his heart, he started to cherish unbelief. And in the process of doing that, the devil was then allowed to work on his mind and allowed him to come up. Actually, he didn't come up with it. But, he started to read what other men wrote and started to say, huh, this makes more sense. Now, I want you to think about this. Do you realize that Charles Darwin and Ellen White were contemporaries? Yeah. Do you think that's coincidental? That when he came up and started to promote a theory of evolution and it started to gain traction, that God raised up a church whose focus was to bring the people's minds back to Him as Creator God by worshiping Him on the Sabbath day? Do you think that's coincidental? No. You need to see how God has worked through all this because today, within the Adventist church, there is this battle that keeps raging of who are we? I have been told I cannot preach what I'm preaching today because we want to be like everybody else. We're not special. We're not God's remnants. We are just a part of the big picture. And I would tell you, show me that from Scripture because I'll show you where we are special. Where God raised up a specific peculiar people to give a specific message. And the Adventist church in the past has been the only one given that message. Show me another church and denomination that's preaching Revelation 14 in its proper context. So the woman flees into the wilderness for 1260 years. That means she goes into hiding in solitary places of the earth to escape persecution. This is the same time period spoken of in Daniel 7.25 and Revelation 13.4-7. We looked at that already. This time period starts when? I have it up there. 538 A.D. Do you know what happened in 538 A.D.? This is why we're historicists. Okay? It's right up there. Do you know who Justinian was? Emperor of Rome. Justinian addressed the Pope as being the head of all the churches. 538 A.D. Is that an important date? Yes. <laughs> you figure out your 1260 years, if this is your starting date, then you can find your ending date. Right? This time period starts in 538 A.D. Justinian addressed the Pope as being head of all the churches. Turn with me real quick to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Diane, do you have that? 
Can you read it? For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. But that's a good that's a good scripture that she read though. Paul tells you there that he was entrusted with what? The gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. And that he preached what God gave him to preach. That it didn't come from men, but it came directly from God. And Paul also realized the importance of that trust that God gave to him. God gives to you and I the same trust. And as a church, we need to be faithful to that call. Do you have 2 Thessalonians? Yeah, I have 2 Thessalonians now. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It's going to talk about the falling away. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will come, unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is a... Another correlating text that goes with Daniel 7 and also Revelation 13. It's talking about this man of sin, the son of perdition, who wants to be God. He wants to be worshipped. And he speaks great and blasphemous things. 538 AD, Justinian addresses or addressed the Pope as being the head of all the churches. Is that important? Yes. It is because it gives you the starting date of when Paul says this falling away would take place. And that man of sin would be what? Revealed. Do we know who that is? Yes. Have we known who that is for a while? Yes. Listen, brothers and sisters, we're not, as Seventh-day Adventists, we're not the first Protestant church to proclaim this. Do you realize that every single Protestant reformer understood who that was. Do you also realize that they were all historicists in their interpretation of Scripture? And do you realize that it came afterwards that the Protestant churches started to fall away from that? Hence the rise of preterism and futurism. Do you also know where those two schools of theology came from? Jesuits. Because that entity needed a way to divert the focus that the reformers were putting on them to show who this son of perdition was, who this abomination of desolation was. And so they came up with these two views of interpreting scripture. Preterism, everything that happened in the past before the rise at 538. Or futurism, everything's going to happen in the future. It can't be us. They're able to understand dark secrets and mysteries. Is this important? This is why I came into the church in the first place. Because I listened to this, I saw in scripture, then I went home, and this was before your internet, your personal computer, and I looked in the Encyclopedia Britannica and found most of this. Do you remember those, Wesley? Or are you still too young for that? Okay. Being bored, and the teacher was boring, that's what we used to do, is go in and read the Encyclopedia Britannica. All of this can be found in history. It's not hard and it's not hidden. But do you understand how well Satan has been in deceiving the people? Because he has taken these two views and he has exalted them and the churches have grasped them and now that's what they hold and they teach. God has raised up a remnant movement to bring all of his people. Revelation says Babylon has fallen, has fallen, come out of her, my people. 
Revelation also tells you that the bride has made herself ready. That she has thrown off all false doctrine. That she now has the righteous robes of Jesus Christ on her. She is clean. And she is perfect. She has come to an understanding of the truth.